Awesome. Thank you. So welcome to the OSPO working group meeting as part of the chaos project. Uh, as a reminder, it is covered under the uh, chaos uh, code of conduct. So please be kind to each other. Um, and with that, I think we'll go ahead and get started. If you haven't already, the link for the notes is in the chat. If you want to add yourself and your comfort movie. We've got some some interesting ones. We've got a few that I've never heard of. Like I've never heard of Snatch or it, Idiots. It's uh, one of those Jason Statham British underground crime movies, which uh, really comforts me for some reason. Interesting. Okay. Um, should I welcome myself or does somebody else want to do that? Uh, welcome, Don Foster. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll do the welcome. Um, so if you haven't heard, Don Foster is going to, Don is going to take on the, a new role as the director of data science for the chaos project full-time, uh, starting in August. And Don is going to be joining us from VMware. Uh, and I just can't tell you how unbelievably excited we are to have Don join us. And thanks to the Sloan foundation for making this possible. Um, That's great. So, yeah. So Don, I, you know, if you want to say a few words, that would be awesome as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I am, I am also super excited about this. It's kind of, it's kind of my dream job. Like I get to work on chaos uh, pretty much full time. So uh, VMware was great. So I'm not leaving them because it was a terrible place to work. It's just that this was, this was too awesome for me to turn down. So I get to, I get to play with data. I get to work on chaos and I get to do it as the main part of my job. So it's uh, it's pretty fabulous. And then I will, um, you know, so a few things that I, I do kind of want to focus on initially. One is that, you know, we have these, we have these two pieces of software, right? And we don't provide people with a lot of guidance about which one might work better for them. So I think I'm going to spend some time initially uh, talking to the Augur team and the Grimoire Lab team and seeing if we can better position the software. So depending on the context you're using it in, who you are, what you're trying to get out of it and try and point people to the, the piece of software that's going to be, be best for them. Um, and then, you know, also just start to work across the various contexts to make sure that we're, that we have sort of the right, the right approach for OSPOs, for universities, for, for scientific communities, <clears throat> and, and just, just do what I can to make sure that we're, you know, taking kind of a, a, a data a data based approach to um, to looking at the metrics in a way that we we haven't necessarily done before. So I'd like to you know to to help the chaos project go uh, move from you know a lot of a lot of counting of things to actually deriving real insights from from the work that we do. So I I am super excited about about this. Um, I will, when I actually start in August, I will put together some sort of a plan for the things I um, expect to work on and kind of the priorities so that people can comment on those and, and then we'll figure out, uh, you know, make sure that I'm working on, on the stuff that's going to have the most value for, for the community from a, from a data science approach. And then we'll also likely spin up some sort of data science um, community within, within chaos. So that could be that could be a working group. Maybe that's a good place to start. Maybe we do it as a, you know, kind of a online async thing. I, I don't know. I figure I'll talk to Sophia. I'll talk to some of the data scientists at Red Hat, talk to a few people and see what people think that we we need and what the best approach might be. And so we'll we'll um, start that up sometime and start those conversations at least in, in August. Any questions about yeah, that? Yeah, if anybody has comments. <laughs> Steven. I See, had my little digital hand up, but now I put my real hand up. So um, I know some of the folks in the virtual room, but not all of them, know that RIT has been uh, playing around with first Grimoire Lab and now um, Augur around academic metrics in an effort we call Mystic. Um, I know Mike recently made the choice to move from one to the other. So Don, it'd probably be good for you and him to chat once you're doing your thing to find out why we made the switch and what we're doing and what we're hoping to provide um, to make that happen. You know, the it would also be good for you to know what 
is happening on the academic side at the, the upper level. Very briefly, there's a group called the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment. Terrible name, but they didn't start to be an organization. They started to write a thing. They got funded to do a dashboard top level across universities on what their different open policies were and how they were handling research assessment and stuff like that. So they're like the, the top level. We've been working on a tool to try to help academics create a parsable record for their supervisors and promotion committees and so on and so forth. So look, here's my dashboard. Here's what I did. Here is the impact and translation of the work that I do. So that's it in a nutshell. And you and Mike and maybe I should chat once you come online in, in August. Yeah, that would be perfect. I would, I would love that. Thank you. Uh, Brian, you have your hand up. Yeah, just a similar thing and not to detract from <clears throat> Augur and the work that they're doing too, but Red Hat is currently in partnership with the Augur team. And we've built a, a few um, visual dashboards and, and tools that go along with that as well. I'm just chiming in and saying, happy to talk to you about our efforts when you're ready. Yeah, absolutely. I would, I would love to chat more about that. Yeah. Uh, and you, yeah. and Mike, you and Mike and I should probably also chat about what you're doing. And we don't have to wait till August to do that. Yeah, I, okay. think, I think, Steve, and I showed you and Mike the 8 knot dashboard, which is effectively now the front end of Augur. <clears throat> Um, I think so. I am deferring a lot of that to Mike. So okay. um, I'll see if Mike can extend his British timeline to start dropping in on this more often. Um, okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, Sophia, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to, to let you know, because you weren't in the call on Tuesday, so I don't know if you listened to it yet, but generally everyone was really pumped about this. <laughs> Um, and we talked a lot about what we thought your role could be. And they were like, maybe we should let Dawn tell us what her role is going to be before <laughs> we start <laughs> getting too excited about it. But I mostly just like, I think something that came up that I wanted to bring up at least to you directly was that clearly there's a lot of interest in a role like this and what you could be doing. And so I think not to ask you for anything yet, because you haven't even started, but it's one of those things where the more you can share what you're working on or how you want to work with the broader community. I think the interest is always going to be higher than one person's bandwidth. Always. I would just like wager a guess. Um, mostly we're just super pumped to have you in this role. And I think there's going to be a lot of things for you to pick and choose. So the, I guess we're mostly, well, I'm mostly just waiting for guidance from you on what you want to work on, what you want to take on and how best to sort of suggest and throw things at you to see how you want to take them. Like, I don't, I don't want to throw things at you. I'd love to throw things at you in a way that is appropriate for your role and how you like working. <laughs> yeah, that sounds, that sounds great. Cause I, um, you know, a big, a big part of this role is really taking input from people and figuring out what, what we can do with this data science role within, within the broader chaos community to make, you know, just, uh, you know, a better experience for everybody. So, so I absolutely uh, want feedback on, on the things that I'm working on and the priorities and, and what makes sense. And then I also think that, you know, as a part of building this, this broader data science community, that there are going to be loads of opportunities for, for me to work with other, other data scientists and partner on, on various things or for other data scientists to work together and partner on things that are going to help the chaos community. So I think I think the you know the the other piece of this is really forming that data science community around around chaos so that we can all all kind of work together and learn from each other and and do interesting things on behalf of the chaos project. So I'm yeah I'm super I'm super excited and I, I'm looking forward to getting lots of ideas for for what we should be working on. Okay, so we spent enough time talking about me. I'm just gonna move on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Matt, metrics, uh, maturity model. Yeah, so this is, I'll just, I'll, I'll present this. This is something that has kind of come up over the course of the last several weeks. And I think it leads into a discussion that Emma had brought up in Slack uh, earlier this week that we could probably talk about as well. Um, so also talking with the university OSPO working group. So uh, 
a couple of things that have come up is, is trying to identify metrics or metrics models that are appropriate to understand the use of open source within an organization. That's, that's this line right here. And we really think that would, at least coming from the university side, that that would be an appropriate set of models and answer a, a, a set of questions that are really around that. The other that has actually come up here fairly often, and I also think is coming up in the university side of things, is metrics regarding a demonstration of value of the OSPO within an organization, which is a likely a different set of metrics that we would want to, to think about. Um, do these two, I'll start here before I show the maturity framework thing, but do these two kind of resonate with people or do they make sense or am I completely off on this? You know, a set of metrics about use of open source within an org and a set of metrics kind of <laughs> about the value of an open source program office within an organization. Curious what people think about that differentiation. Yes. So, I mean, the differentiation is good. I mean, if we look at what's happened in industry recently, being unable to demonstrate the value of an OSPO has had repercussions, to say the least. Um, but again, in the university context, as we've been discussing in here off and on for a couple of years now, moving beyond just software is really key to... Um, to moving things forward at the university, all of the federal emphasis on open scholarship, open data, open science, so on and so forth, and the need for the ability to surface the invisible metrics beyond just artifact generation are going to be important, right? So being able to document the need for an impact of community work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, is the stuff that all universities are going to need and only a few of them know they're going to need or recognize that they're going to need at the moment. Yep. Well, that's fair. Um, Brian? I was initially going to be contrary, but then I decided I'd ask a clarifying question. When you yes. said, um, personal growth, um, when you said in the minutes you in the agenda you have the use of open source and then the value of OSPO. Like are you seeing like depending on how you do that, it's like use of open source could also be value of open source. Certainly. I'm, yeah. Well, I'm sure, I'm and sure if that's the case, well, All but right. then there's also the process and how efficiently it's running. That could also be a definition of use. Okay. My, here's where the contrary part comes in. If we're talking about value in both cases, then I'm not sure the differentiation needs to be there. Okay. Because if you as an OSPO can't, you can't, um, you can't demonstrate the value of open source within your organization, then you've got that problem. Like now you have a problem as an actual functioning organization because if you can't do, it's like you can't do your job. What good are you? And I and I I'm hugely oversimplifying. So you know, if we're talking about just straight up value, I'm wondering if the differentiation is necessary. If you are talking about use of open source, like how efficiently does it mesh with existing business plans? How good is your onboarding and yada yada, things like that? Then I could see the differentiation. Um, so that's my initial two cents on okay. that. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Remy has a comment in uh, chat as well. Okay. Yeah. The starting at the end of it, I'd say like for the value of an OSPO within an organization, uh, some of the ways that, you know, we've described or presented value like that in the past, and this is not an exhaustive list is. Now, first, I think you need to split to inbound and outbound, um, understanding what your focus is on whether or not you're talking about the value of inbound open source to an organization versus whether outbound is a big difference. Um, I'm learning that in government land, outbound open source is less of a concern. Inbound is much more of a priority as opposed to corporate OSPOs. So um, I would start by just sort of splitting those two streams. And then um, things like 
number of repos outbounded is a metric that if you're tracking outbound and then, you know, whether or not those outbounded repos actually are in compliance or not, I think that the maturity model around like everybody is doing open source, it's whether or not your OSPO is getting ahead of it and helping to guide it or whether or not it's just going out into the wild is like a an observed pattern, I would say, that a lot of organizations see. So the more that you can outbound compliant open source projects that are mature and then depending on what your maturity model is, is like a, a value prop for, you know, I would plug into this area. I wouldn't say it's the only one. I think that over indexing on outbound open source repositories is a mistake that a lot of people sort of take when they think about the value of an open source program. But it is one that a lot of um, at least in the corporate world, a lot of folks put a lot of emphasis on. Um, I will, you know, stop there because I've been talking for a long time, but I could go on on a list of sort of what I've seen uh, people, stakeholders thinking is valuable within, you know, reporting out metrics. That's really great feedback, Remy. I think, um, Gary, you also have your hand up. Yeah, I wish uh, Remy talked longer because I'm, I'm, hearing a lot of what he's saying and I'm agreeing with a lot of it. Um, I actually think I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go on a limb here and say OSPO maturity framework is way too big by itself, just with the two topics that you have of use of open source and then the value of an OSPO because use of open source is like so diverse in, are you talking about the SDLC? Are you talking about what happens when a project is deployed and how do you maintain it? Are you talking about the long-term maintenance of projects, like uh, what the maturity is in regards to how up-to-date dependencies are? You can go very deep on just the software development uh, that goes along with using open source, especially when you're talking about larger companies, or even when you're talking about startups, you can be very specific about a lot of aspects of what an OSPO is delivering on in regards to changing culture for a uh, use of open source within an organization. And then um, to follow up on the other point that you had first, which is the metrics regarding the value of an OSPO within an organization, the like myriad ways that an OSPO delivers value, I think um, normally in to do aren't looked at as like a maturity model, but they're looked at as like things that you do in an OSPO depending on situations that you might run into. And then you can grow the OSPO by taking on more responsibilities, but it's not like if you're doing this, then you're mature. If you're doing this, then you're mature. Maybe it's more like the larger and the more responsibilities total that you've gathered, that might be a maturity model because you have so much that then interconnects and plays with one another, right? Um, I think that this topic of a maturity framework for an OSPO is big enough that it should be split into at least two models of using open source effectively and then um, the value of what the OSPO is delivering. And that wasn't even covering what Remy had started to bring up, which is like the, the pitfalls that you can fall into with publishing open source. And is that even important? Is that something that an OSPO needs to look at? And I think in that lens, it's it's about how much an OSPO is able to enable that ability rather than the actual success of any given project. Because most projects that people open source wind up doing very little, but that's not the fault of the OSPO and that's not a metric that they should judge themselves successful or unsuccessful on because it, it's completely out of their control. All right, now I've been talking too long and I'm going oh, to put my are, hand up. This is great. <laughs> I yeah. really appreciate this. I have no... Do you have a comment, Emma, or did we cover what you were... Yeah, I think it was mostly covered. I mean, I think just so much like giant <laughs> I mean, like main thoughts. I'm also like, I mean, OSPOs are evolving. Like, is OS is OSPO even the right definition? Like, I related to the university, like having worked in the university, the connection with open science and open education, all those things that are um, might be in the capacity of an open source programs office as like. AI and LM start to emerge and people talk like there's an evolution as well as a maturity. Like I'm kind of trying to think about the tension between is it about saying an open source programs office is a solution and this is what that solution looks like, or are we looking at it as a um an evolution of how we approach open like use of open source 
release, uh, but release of open things. Um, so my point is pretty, I put my hand down because I don't have it well formed, but I just, I guess I have the question to myself is like, how do we accommodate the, uh, the evolution of the OSCO as part of this? Which it definitely is, right? Uh, but it definitely is evolving. So I don't have the answer, but that's the question I have in my head. <laughs> Can I react to that, Emma? Because I was also thinking the same thing. Maybe this is also because we're we both work at large companies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have to imagine that, like, I've only been in this role for three years, but even in it, our team has changed, shaped multiple times, mm -hmm. um, and now we're at a point where we don't necessarily have all those. Fun we don't own necessarily those functions as much, but we're we work with distributed teams that take them on because they're really complex problems. Like understanding the consumption of open source at the scale of thousands requires more people than just one person or a part of the time of one person. And while that function started in OSPO as a way to sort of set some initial ground rules or policies and processes around how we ingest open source software, the, the problem became a lot bigger that when we were talking about say maintenance and patches and upgrades and it just it became a much bigger problem and now there's a whole other team that does that and it's not mm -hmm. OSPO it's just an open source affiliate team because it is just embedded in our operational model as a massive company we couldn't do that only from a centralized function anymore where there are roles that are that are coming out of OSPO but they don't necessarily always stay with OSPO in a way where I think OSPO as a term doesn't really necessarily describe how open source operates at our company anymore in a way that I think that is sort of a natural evolution of trying to scale these functionality and embed them inside a large organization. Like it is going to grow, change, and shape. And so I, I think the more that I'm talking about it, the more that I feel like if you're trying to look at something like a maturity model, mm -hmm. then instead of bounding it around a team that could look incredibly different by company, maybe we instead group it by task and maturity within task. Um, and that way it's like, well, if I don't do those five things, then that shouldn't detract from my maturity because maybe either we'll do them one day or maybe another team will do them. It won't necessarily be OSPO and also we consulted on those, but not necessarily running them all just because there's too many things to do. <laughs> um, and so I, I don't know, I just like, that's kind of a reaction where um, it just, it's, it's gonna look a little bit different in every company. And so I think we, we need to have flexibility in the way that we define it. Yeah, you just made me, when you were um, speaking, made me think about the OSCO as being a place for innovation as well, and that that innovation might, you know, an experimentation might prove something that then becomes a function of another team. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, Maria. Hi, um, I just wanted to bring up like, um, because I find that I have to educate so much about what open source is and the capabilities that um, there might be a component necessary in thinking about who talking, helping people understand like who and what they're trying to accomplish. And sometimes with the open source, we have, uh, there's like, um, are they contrib are we focusing on the developers and the contributors? Are we focusing on the features and the software? You know, there's just so many different avenues. I, you know, I really agree with the idea of the diversity of it that um, it might be just a little bit helpful to kind of have a, a lens of of thinking about how we have to educate from the beginning with um, where they see their uh, where an organization might see the objective that they're trying to reach because um, they might want to integrate open source in one way and there might be another way dealing with the contributors that's a little bit different and the metrics kind of will be different for those two things so i hope that makes sense it does so so thank you i um, and I, I actually, hopefully I can address that in the in a tab here in a second. There are comments in the chat that I wasn't following. Um, does anybody, could anybody make sure those get into the minutes here? Or if you want to comment on them out in here, that'd be great too. No problem there. But I see like from Justin...
So could somebody at least just copy and paste those over? Um, so this is a, amazing feedback, and I'm gonna I'll make the the claim that that those two things that I put on there with respect to the use of open source within an organization and um, value of an OSPO was really meant to just generate conversation. So I did a great job in in, <laughs> in doing in doing just just that. Um, so it gives you a, it gives me a, a lot to to think about. Um, and this will probably thank you for putting those notes in from the chat. This, I'm sure that the next tab will have no comments as well, um, but I'm going to go ahead and show it. please continue your comments because what I'm trying to do here is just capture the conversation that's coming from this group and move us forward in such ways that we can think about the metrics and metrics models that help provide insights in whatever particular areas of the organization you would like to provide insight. So I mean, we're trying to get to a spot where your OSPO has particular challenges in your organization and ultimately metrics and metrics models can provide insight and drive decisions around those challenges um, in ways that are useful to you. So if we have to expand this out, that's absolutely no problem. So let me show you at least a proposed, <laughs> proposed maturity framework. Um, I'm sure it will be untouched by the end of this conversation, which is cool. Um, and so this was around at least my thinking on this first one, the value of the OSPO within an organization, which I understand has changed based on this conversation. Um, and trying to think about how we could approach um, thinking about the value of an open source program office within an organization um, around things like business intelligence or business governance, all right? And so what I'm doing here is I'm just trying to break out these, these verticals. So what I'm doing is the domain, I'm just looking at this right-hand side domain here of say governance. So I'm not looking at intelligence at all, at least at this point. And so then saying we have governance and then strategy alignment is this first box here, because this is something we had talked about in prior meetings, like aligning the OSPO with the strategic goals of the organization. And, and I so think I think that came up in the context of in, in some of the recent events at OSPOs, they tend to be viewed as a cost center at the CFO level. And in fact, for most companies, they're a strategic thing. Yes, I, I do think that's what was part of this conversation. So again, I'm just trying to, I'm looking at one of those things that I put in the prior sheet, which is just the value of the OSPO within the organization, breaking it out into these two domains around intelligence and governments. And now for this example, just taking a look at, at, at governance. So from a strategic alignment perspective, this would be an example of a framework. And I don't know what the metrics or metrics models could be to, sh to you know, shed light on any of these objectives. So the first would be aligned of OSPO objectives, for example, with corporate strategy. Um, so there was something that came up around the modernization of tech skills. Like how is an OSPO, is that something that we care about? And do we measure that at all and, and want to track that? You can kind of, without me just reading through this list, of, and these are just accomplished and in progress or just examples. But I don't know what those metrics and metrics models might be if there are agreed upon objectives. And then for compliance and policy, I'm just putting out a few things again of a set of different objectives that might have corresponding metrics and metrics models that can provide insight. And then lastly, around training, which Maria, I think this is kind of what you were talking about as well. Just being part of say newcomer training or being available for internal teams, um, whatever it might be. And so all I'm trying to do is just kind of frame the prior conversation and and then to the point of maybe there's more than just these two things, I totally agree. I 100% agree that there may be more than just these two things as to how we think about um, metrics in, in, this, in the OSPO sense. And we could develop different frameworks to help kind of guide us in thinking about what are the metrics and metrics models that have an intended objective that roll into practice and then into a subsequent domain. I don't know if this is, resonates with anybody, just trying to, to structure the conversation in some way. Silence. I did it. 
<laughs> I, I think I think it's useful. I think it's useful for structuring the conversation on on things like strategy. I think it's important to call out that um, you know there is this. There's I think there's a role that can be played, and I don't know by whom to to try to work to explain the role of an OSPO as a, as a unit of strategy inside of an organization, as opposed to a cost center that provides metrics that are or not, you know, that are that are consumed but not maybe well understood. I think I think that cost center positioning is probably emerges from how much effort it takes for people in executive positions to understand exactly what open source is to their corporate strategy. I don't think that's always fully understood. Yeah, Remy. I just want to say out loud that um, I want to challenge some of the like corporations have decided that OSPOs are not worth the money. I think that a lot of times in layoff situations, you just have to lay off anything that doesn't perform at the core of utmost business function. So like, though it is really important for us to have this, like we need to present the value of OSPOs. I think we also don't want to sort of berate ourselves and say that like people have decided that OSPOs aren't worth it unless we like really go out of our way to explain what's valuable. Like, yes, it's important to explain value, but a lot of these decisions I think have been made out of necessity and we should not take them so personally maybe, or think that they're thought of in such like an intentional way, because like, it's easy for us to say like, these are the things that we might've done that could have been different, but I don't think that those decisions were made that like an OSPO is not a valuable thing necessarily, but that's me as like an outsider. I'm not sure how the individual decisions are made. I just know that in layoff situations that I've seen, um, even letting go of really good, talented people is is never because of performance issues. It's usually just because something has to go. Thanks, Remy. Uh, Gary? Gary, Gary you're on mute. But I, I'm sure it was the same. Yeah, I, I have this fun thing where I have a hardware mute that this microphone turns off, and then I have the software one in Zoom. Um, so Remy, again, I wish you would talk more because I'm I'm finding a lot of springboards from what you're saying that I uh, I think the the layoff scenarios are are valid that it might not always be the case that it's it's you know a cost center thing or they're like ah the OSPO doesn't really matter that much so they're not bringing much value. Um, I think it's also helpful to have a framework that we agree on of like what OSPOs do as functions. And I think that might be more to do group that's not codified in metrics, which feels good to have some metrics that you can use through chaos to say, here's some of the ways that we're bringing value and those those uh, large strategy models that might be um, very intuitive for seasoned veterans of OSPO. Um, are much more accessible to people who maybe don't know that much about open source or are working at a C-suite where they have 400 million other things on their mind. And it's easier to draw those parallels if we have a defined model that we've critiqued and kind of um, put into some form of this is the kind of value that we're presenting and this is why we know that it's it's valid, right? Yeah, just wanted to say that. Thanks, Gary. Okay. Um, so are there co other comments on this? Like, I, I don't, if you all, I saw some comments in the chat that it seemed to at least initially resonate with some people or because Gary said it gives us something to throw stuff at <laughs> or something like that, which is cool too. Um, no problem there. Like, is this worth continuing to think about at least from my perspective to help frame the conversation you could also tell me no this is not helpful at all and i can restart so i'm just it's like this just trying to get this going towards the ways that metrics can provide help for osmos in whatever ways that help is all right i got a thumbs up okay thank you yeah go 
Okay, I'll go. I'll go and, and do that. And then I, I want to see. I don't think it's. I I'll be curious. I don't think it's going to end up where you think it is based on right. this conversation. But I I think you should definitely pursue this. Okay, but I'll try to sift through like these comments as well that came from the chat and just from just to see if there are other models out there that and maybe models isn't the right word. I think Gary had brought that up. You know what I mean? And I that's fair. Um, but yeah, okay, I'll go. And I don't care if you all <laughs> throw up the trash in, in, in a week or two weeks or uh, six months. It doesn't matter as long as it helps move things forward. That's all that's really important to me. Um, and then to 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 kind of the last point um, is the conversation that Emma had brought up. And Emma, I don't know if this is going to fit with what you had put in the Slack channel. So Emma, from what I understood, you had proposed that there could be a, a metric, a couple mm -hmm. metrics or metrics models that organizations uh, deploy and talk about within their organizations to kind of see what the distribution patterns are or what the feedback is or how people respond to the models. Was that correct from what I understood? Um, this is around like just the across companies, the thing that I was talking about. Yeah. So like bringing a couple metrics or metrics models, having them deployed within a couple different, a couple yes. different companies. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm kind of stuck in my own head around these <laughs> things, um, around, but so I feel like there's lots of great metrics, lots of great, great metrics models. Um, for the most part, I can take a metric and find a way to either through Augur or through like data that we have, visualize those, and I can try and test those with different audiences inside of um, whether it's maintainers of Microsoft uh, projects or it's whatever, but that's just me testing it and um, I still, I feel like we still lack a place where we share between us. How that goes, right? Um, and like maybe, for example, or maybe like suggest improvements to queries that that like, oh, this was, you know, I, I used a new contributor once. That's I feel like that's super easy to understand. Like, I would love to to um, take a metric like that and get like three or four volunteers from this group to say like, yes, let's all see how like we can use this metric. And maybe the auger visualization of that, we need to maintain and have a conversation about how that, how they can measure success of their project in some way. Like figuring out like a common shared approach and then how that goes. Um, and so for example, one of the ways that's gone for me is that I can provide a, that sort of visualization, but then a maintainer said, well, who are the new contributors? I'd really like to know that. So then I want to generate a report where I have generated a report, it's like, you have avatar, or email address, like how many contributors, like, so they have a bit of more of a report. So there's like a step beyond the metric. And, um, it, you know, maybe that goes differently for someone at a different organization or someone in a university. But I, I feel like if we could start to, and this is like that community of practice I'm always trying to, like, I mean, chaos is a community of practice. <laughs> it, it doesn't like a, um, like a sub community of practice around individual metrics where we're sharing, improving, and talking about what happens beyond show, showing someone that that metric. Um, and it's again, again a bit behavioral. Like, do do people revisit it, or maybe there's a set of goals across countries. Like, you not only share this with a group of maintainers, but then you you know, you check in in a month or you put like, there's some sort of script that you run and then you compare notes. I don't know. I mean, I'm making this up because I haven't done anything like that before, but I think that'd be really valuable, at least for me to see how that's going for others and would help create some transparency to the actual implementation of metrics in organizations that I don't think we have. And I apologize if that's not something others agree with. Does that make sense? It was a bit of a... Yeah, I, I really like that idea. I mean, I feel like, 
I feel like in the past project, we spent a lot of time talking about how to define metrics, we spent a lot of time talking about, about the metrics themselves, but we don't really spend much time actually, um, you know, implementing them together and talking about what's working, what isn't, what, yes. you know, yes. some of the, the nuances behind actually using these metrics. So I think that's something that um, I, I personally find, find really interesting. And I wonder, I mean, we, we haven't really started the data science working group up, but I wonder if that might be a place that we can maybe have some of these discussions and, and start, start working on, on, like you said, implementing this at a couple of different companies and talking about, you know, talking about our results and talking about um, collaborating on how to make things better. Yeah, and I mean, I even visualize like when you go to the metrics page, here's a metric, oh, and here's a link to how that's worked for, you know, like case studies. Really what we're doing is building case studies, and I think that's what I'm describing. Um, and then that would be inspiring to people, oh, like, you know, this company tried it and went this way, and well, they they decided to not have this particular join in the query or something, I don't know. but like it would just help move it forward and, and create conversation. So I would love to do that at some point whenever anyone is ready. And I think just one metric can go for like three months. Like it doesn't have to feel heavy or anything, but I would love to experiment with that at some point was my, my uh, proposal. So I would like to experiment with that too. Um, I also love to it. Figure out how to give it legs. Yeah. Is there was there something in particular, Emma, that you were thinking about with respect to a metric or a metric model? Um, I don't feel super opinionated about it. Something that's fairly simple to explain to um, a maintainer, I guess. Not that they wouldn't understand most things, but um, something I get asked about a lot is community engagement. So you know, uh, looking at that, and I think there's like a, a metric model around. There is an engagement, but there's a couple around that that vein. So anything around new contributors or responsiveness is always an interesting one because that can measure people can actually use that metric to their detriment. <laughs> but, but we could talk about that. Yeah, I don't feel super opinionated. I always I always default to new contributors because I think that gets people maintainers thinking about the human side of things and motivations, but. Exactly. So I'm pulling something up, but it brought up the, there's a, is it, there's a model, have we talked about this here? This should look familiar to some of you. This is- Yeah, we, we've talked about the starter project health model. Here, I mean, this is just, I'm not saying this is the one that, the, I just I just immediately thought of this. This is kind of listening to you talk, Emma. Mm -hmm. Kind of a, a model that Don had spent quite a bit of time putting together and just how we would understand something like this, just as a possible candidate in the future. Yeah. That one or how or, or people have a lot of questions, especially those type of projects that are startup-y. Uh, who's using my technology? Like how do I you know, um, who are potential partners? Like, what are they building with this thing that our open source project? That's a hard one. I know that it would be interesting to test around that too, see what works for different groups. Right on. Okay. Thank uh, you for listening to me. <laughs> this is, I think it's a great idea. And I think <laughs> I really like the idea. Yeah, this is great. And, and in general, like not necessarily, uh, you know, what you said, Emma, but I think, I think also like having better case studies around the chaos project would be, would be really, really good. Mm -hmm. so they could come out of the work that you're talking about, but I would encourage all of the rest of you um, to think about, you know, maybe doing a, a chaos case study about the way that you're using metrics within your OSPO. Um, mm -hmm. In particular, Gary, I'd love to see I'd love to see you do one when you get a little farther with your um, with your work. But I think it's something that we should all be thinking about: is you know how can we how can we talk more publicly about the work that we're doing with metrics within our OSPOs in a way that um, you know helps other people see the possibilities. I think so. 
just just kind of food for thought. So Gary, I think we've run out of time to do your um, your item unless you can do it in one minute. Should I just move it to to the next meeting? Yeah, we can move it to the next meeting. It was kind of a follow on. We had mentioned AI a little bit while we were talking, and I realized that there's probably some relevant work um, and metrics that we would want to track. Uh, this is a brand new thing, so now would be the time for us to start talking about it. Been in Augur for three years, but yes. Well, <laughs> brand new for me, doesn't that mean it's brand new for everyone? No, I mean, exactly. I, I, well, I think we're not doing anything like chat GPT. So yeah. I think the conversations around it are new. Um, yeah. it's, it's a technology that's been around for a really long time, but I feel like the, the conversations around it are are definitely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. P particularly for OSPOs, right? Having yeah. a governing. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. I'm not talking about it now. Okay, cool. So I will put that on the agenda for the for the next one. Uh, any any final words before we wrap up because we're out of time? Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, everyone. everybody. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.